Welcome to How Positive Are You, a podcast series that looks at the junk science of HIV and AIDS from all angles, patients, scientists, and observers, and particularly its many victims. I'm Rethinking AIDS President David Crow in Western Canada, on the line with Elizabeth Ely in New York City. Hi, David. Hi, Beth. Are you ready to meet today's interviewee? Well, I think I know our interviewee pretty well. Um, Clark Baker is the CEO and Principal Investigator at the Office of Medical and Scientific Justice, also known as OMSJ. We met while doing joint public relations work for the Semmelweis Society Clean Hands Awards in Washington, D.C. in 2008 and have remained friends ever since. I currently work for him on a freelance basis. I do take care of some of his publicity and online public relations. I'm proud to work for this organization, which has consulted on more than 50 criminal cases since 2009. Uh, All but four of those arrangements have accomplished favorable plea bargains, acquittals, or withdrawal of all HIV-related charges. Recently, however, OMSJ was dealt a setback with an Atlanta jury's guilty verdict against 43-year-old Craig Lamar Davis. Davis was on trial for two counts of aggravated assault stemming from sexual contact with a woman in Clayton County, Georgia, and faces a possibly similar trial involving a woman in Fulton County. Davis allegedly did not tell his sexual partners that he had tested HIV positive in 2005. At a sentencing hearing scheduled for February the 21st, 2014, he faces up to 20 years in prison. A jury took just one hour to find Mr. Davis guilty, despite testimony from three scientific witnesses provided by OMSJ, Rodney Richards, Ph.D., David Rasnick, Ph.D., and Nancy Turner Banks, M.D. All three testified that currently available HIV tests are not sufficient to diagnose HIV infection. Why are we so concerned about this trial? and not the more than 50 OMSJ victories, Clark. Um, Is there something that makes this case a little bit more unusual than the rest? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I admire your work and uh, and your assistance in our operations as well. Uh, What makes this case different is uh, is that most of them end up being plea bargained uh, or prosecutors dismiss the charges when we produce the evidence that shows that uh, uh, the defendant was never infected uh, or, or was never diagnosed. And uh, in this particular case, we didn't have an opportunity to talk with the prosecution's expert witnesses. And we usually can get a deposition arranged or an interview arranged where the prosecution can see our hand before the uh, trial begins. And in this case, the prosecution just went ahead because there was a lot of press involved in the case and there was a lot of pressure on the prosecution to uh, to pursue the prosecution rather than dismiss the charges. It was media-driven based on the hysteria and the salacious allegation that our client was a pastor or a minister who had been spreading something other than God's word to the uh, to his congregations? None of that was true, as as it turned out in the trial. But the allegations were so outrageous that uh, the prosecution would have had difficulty uh, withdrawing their charges because of the hysteria. And another thing that made the case interesting was that we usually don't have an opportunity to cross-examine the medical doctor uh, in a courtroom for the trial. And in this case, we not only had the doctor who allegedly diagnosed our client, but we also had the doctor who allegedly diagnosed uh, the victim, and we had officials from Quest Diagnostics who allegedly uh, conducted the tests. And the doctors all testified when, when we finally got a chance to question them, they all admitted that they had not conducted a diagnosis. None of them had ever diagnosed the defendant or the alleged victim. And Amazing. And they and they pointed at Quest and they said, well, Quest was the one that made the diagnosis. So when we had an opportunity to question Quest, Quest said, oh no, we don't do diagnoses. That's up to the doctor. So a doctor is saying when I get a piece of paper back from Quest, and on it it says, 
reactive or positive or whatever for HIV, that's my diagnosis. And all I do, all I am is a mouthpiece. And I go to the person and say, Quest Diagnostics. I mean, I wouldn't say that, but that's what the implication is. Quest Diagnostics has said that you're HIV positive. That means in your mind that you're HIV infected. That means you got AIDS. The doctors didn't even say that. Uh, the alleged victim's doctor, uh, his name is uh, Wendell Hackney uh, in Atlanta. Uh, he basically said that, uh, no, I, I'm not familiar with the HIV uh, test package insert. Uh, I made no effort to diagnose. I relied on the lab report by Quest. Right. And Quest, in turn, says... We don't issue diagnoses. We just issue lab reports. So Quest is pointing at the doctors, and the doctors are pointing at Quest, and nobody takes responsibility for this. That's right. Did the jury understand the conversation? No. If they did, it didn't matter to them. All that mattered to them was the fear, hysteria, and propaganda that they've heard for 30 years. You have to remember that Clayton County is uh, is an extremely low income, largely uneducated population uh, over there, and uh, the jury was comprised of some people who are most likely driven by their emotions. Uh, there were thirty witnesses called, and there were sixty about sixty exhibits introduced into evidence, and yet this jury. Uh, was so taken with all of the uh, witnesses who claimed that our client uh, went into the jail. For example, in 2009, he was arrested on a little traffic uh, warrant. And uh, uh, during the booking intake, he had said that he's HIV positive and that he needed a, a special diet. Well, an alleged HIV diagnosis cannot be made by the defendant. It's not like he's missing a left arm. And he can point to a stump and say, hey, I'm missing a left arm. And everybody looks at it and says, yeah, wow, you really are missing a left arm. HIV cannot be sensed by any of the human senses. Uh, it can't be tasted or smelled or touched or seen. So all our client did since 2005 was tell people what the doctor told him. And when right. we got the doctor on the stand... Uh, the doctor said, hey, I never diagnosed him. Uh, by the way, uh, according to ProPublica, Dollars for Docs, the physician who allegedly diagnosed our client, who admitted on the stand that he never diagnosed him, was uh, Courtney Shelton, MD, out of Atlanta Medical Center. And Dr. Shelton, according to ProPublica, has received thousands of dollars from a bunch of different pharmaceutical companies. So uh, I don't know what um, Dr. Shelton's game is, but his testimony was pretty clear that he had never diagnosed our client. And since that's part of the allegation that our client has to be infected with uh, HIV, if the prosecutor had uh, had any self-respect as an officer of the court, once Dr. Shelton admitted that he never diagnosed our client with HIV, they should have withdrawn all of the charges. Right. The legal logic is that if you've been diagnosed by a medical professional with HIV infection, that you then are counseled to understand that you could transmit the virus with unprotected sexual contact, and therefore it's a criminal act if you have unprotected sex at that point. But if there never was a diagnosis, then the chain is broken. And so this man is never properly informed that he's HIV infected because the doctor is saying, I don't know how to do that. And a lab report doesn't constitute a diagnosis. I mean, the lab said it didn't. And you can't just put a piece of paper in front of an, an, an average Joe and say, here's a piece of paper from Quest uh, you know, if you don't follow the implications of this, you're going to go to jail. Like, that's not right either. So it should have all fallen apart. Yeah, it should have at that time. And uh, uh, law enforcement officers, the prosecution, uh, even the court should have understood that immediately. In fact, uh, one of the individuals who testified uh, was uh, Thomas Burgess. Uh, he's the director at Quest Diagnostics in Tucker 
Georgia, where, where this was handled. He admitted he was unfamiliar with the package insert. He thought that there was a, a, a new revision to the insert uh, when there wasn't one. And he admitted that Quest Diagnostics does not diagnose HIV. They simply, uh, according to the, um, uh, the diagnostics technician, I think her name was uh, Corrine Otis. Uh, there was another one, uh, Elenita Godoy. Both of them work at uh, the Tucker uh, facility, Quest Diagnostics. Uh, they both said, hey, we just, we just run the test. We don't know how accurate it is. We run the test, and we send the test results back to the doctor. So this is an admission. And not only that, but the infectious disease doctor, Joyce Drayton of Emory University Hospital and Atlanta Medical Center, she testified that this is the medical standard of care in, uh, in Atlanta and across the United States. So that suggests to me, based on their testimony, the doctors, Dr. Drayton and Quest Diagnostics, I'd say roughly 90% of all HIV positive uh, results were probably never diagnosed. What would constitute proper diagnosis? I mean, for okay. putting aside all the questions about whether HIV tests mean anything, but what would... That's, your, that's a great question. Definition. Uh, here's... Uh, I mean, when when I was a police officer, I couldn't just stick a tube in your mouth and uh, and say, "Oh, uh, uh, Dave and Beth are drunk," uh, and they're and and arrest you for drunk driving. I actually have to see some uh, symptoms of drunk driving. I have to see some bad driving. Uh, I have to, you know, pull you over for a traffic violation. I uh, walk to the driver's side and I ask you for your driver license and I see the red and watery eyes and I see some bad coordination. I smell some alcohol uh, beverage coming from your mouth, from the inside of the car. Those things, the probable cause that, gee, there's some impairment. And then I have to ask you, you know, are you, are you under the care of the doctor? Are you sick? Uh, are you taking any kind of medication? And those questions will rule out all of the other things that could be causing an impairment. You know, if you're a diabetic and you're in the uh, initial stages of uh, diabetic shock, it's bad form for me as a police officer to arrest you for drunk driving. Uh, so I have to rule all those out with, with basically what is called a differential diagnosis. And then we do the field sobriety test. And based on all the symptoms and your failure to perform the test as directed, uh, I can then render an opinion as to whether you're intoxicated or not and, and, uh, and put you in jail. And that is, that is the standard for a, a drunk driving arrest. And if I don't meet all of those requirements, there's no case and the prosecutor would never prosecute it. In this case, uh, you basically have a, a bunch of doctors who said, oh, the defendant's is symptomatic. We relied on a test that the package insert says that the significance of a positive result in an asymptomatic patient is unknown. And so the test itself in the FDA package inserts, these legal documents, tell the court, and this document was introduced into evidence, it informs the court that the test cannot diagnose HIV, has no idea what the test result means in an asymptomatic person. Our client was asymptomatic, and all of the people involved in the test and diagnosis admitted that they never diagnosed him. Yeah, but they told him they did. And here's the point that a lot of people were making. If he thought even erroneously, that he had a sexually transmitted disease, a deadly one, and he didn't tell his sexual partners, then he's a jerk. Okay, but my argument is, since when does being a jerk get you in jail for up to 20 years? I mean, it, it's like a fake deadly weapon. The, there was a big deal about, you know, oh, he's carrying a deadly weapon. Even if it's a fake deadly weapon, and he's convinced he's got it, then then he should have told them, okay, well, that's kind of an interesting ethical question, yes, but that doesn't mean that he was endangering them. The theory that the prosecution uses, and we all know this from the current terrorism problem that we have, is that it's quite often uh, that you'll get a uh, terrorist uh, or, or someone who wants to commit murder, and, uh, and he, he or she looks for a, a person to help commit the murder, 
and an FBI or local law enforcement uh, undercover officer would meet the person. Uh, they would uh, provide inert materials to make an inert bomb that the defendant tries to detonate. Now, in that case, there's no danger to the public, and the person can be convicted, and rightfully so. And, and so that's the theory that the prosecution uses. However, uh, HIV is much more like uh, a Star Wars lightsaber. If I sell David a Star Wars lightsaber on eBay for $20 and tell him that he can go downtown to the, uh, to the main intersection and hack people to death uh, with this Star Wars lightsaber, uh, the most that's going to happen is law enforcement pick him up for a 72-hour psychological <laughs> hold, and nobody would ever prosecute him because uh, everyone knows— You mean those knows- things don't work? No, they don't work, David. I, I'm sorry to break that to you. Uh, and Yoda is is not real either. You're shattering. But, uh, you're shattering. But right? but, but my, my my point and and there's uh, there's uh, there's a factual basis. Uh, a man uh, in uh, a Portland man uh, in uh, Oregon did this exact thing. I think he went to a Walmart and purchased a Star Wars lightsaber and then went into a parking lot and tried to hack people to death with it. And, uh, and he was put on a hold. No charges were filed. Uh, and so the object has to be, have, have the potential of being a deadly weapon. Uh, we know that bombs are real. We know that firearms are real. And uh, so if, uh, uh, and anybody, uh, you know, any, any high school dropout can buy gunpowder and, uh, and materials for a pipe bomb and detonate it to gain the empirical knowledge that a bomb can explode and kill people. Uh, but with regard to Star Wars lightsabers and HIV, the evidence does not exist that HIV uh, is an existential threat. The evidence just isn't there. Right. Good distinction. Good answer. The fact that it's not a threat can be argued on the fact that it's not pathogenic, that it's not sexually transmitted that it doesn't exist. There's lots of different approaches to that. What the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, calls HIV, we have photographed. We have photographed cultured HIV uh, using electron microscopes. We've even spiked samples of my own blood with HIV, and I have photographs of my blood sample uh, containing HIV in it that we spiked. So whatever it is that they call HIV, it does exist. However, uh, those individuals and experts who think that HIV does not exist, they're also correct in the sense that it, it has, HIV has never been seen naturally in human blood. It does, right. it does not appear to exist in human blood. It is a laboratory artifact that people claim it was found in blood or lymph tissues. So both sides are correct in this. Right. It, you have participated in some of these electron microscope studies. And one of the questions that came up was, well, gee, maybe there's not very much HIV, so how do we know we can see it? But when you spike blood with a known quantity of these particles, whatever they are, you can see those under the electron microscope, correct? Yes. And in, in natural blood of an HIV-positive person, you do not see particles like that? Uh, We prevailed in five military cases in 2012 and 13 uh, by showing, by demonstrating that the defendant had no evidence of HIV in their blood. And this was not done in this trial? No, it wasn't done uh, because the uh, federal government, one of the prosecutors in one of our military cases, pressured uh, University of Massachusetts uh, to stop uh, helping us. Uh, They basically committed a felony uh, uh, intimidating a witness in in our case, and they they ended up harming our case. But we're we're finding other labs uh, to assist us with this work. Right. Well, you did present quite strong evidence against a, a credible diagnosis of HIV. My concern is that these trials very rarely going before juries, at least civilian juries, not the military ones, and usually the prosecution just cutting and running when they see that we're going to bring real evidence. This is kind of a milestone in that they didn't do that, and they went before a jury, and they were victorious. 
yay for them. So are, is this going to embolden them? Are, do you think that a lot more of these HIV-related criminal cases will now go to trial? Will OMSJ continue to push for a defense based on faulty HIV tests, knowing that in this case, at least, a scary, scary precedent was set that juries will just ignore that? You asked a complex question, so I'll, I'll try to answer the uh, issue of jury nullification first. There are some people who think that uh, jury nullification is a legitimate act performed by jurors, that if, uh, if, a, um, uh, if a juror believes that uh, a law is unjust uh, or that a, a person shouldn't been arrested, they can acquit a factually guilty person. That's the good side of uh, jury nullification. However, uh, the, the problem exists when a jury uses nullification to convict a factually innocent individual. And when you have a court and prosecutors who are engaged in actively uh, uh, to inflame passions of a jury and to encourage them to ignore the evidence, that kind of a kangaroo court has nothing to do with the formation of, uh, of the um, uh, court system in the United States. But, but you know, that said, uh, justice is not perfect in the United States, and juries are not perfect, and uh, a perfect trial was not guaranteed. Just a, a reasonably performed trial against Mr. Davis was guaranteed, and, and it was reasonable. The only problem was that you had a jury that completely ignored the evidence. I was wondering if this might embolden prosecutors going forward to go to trial knowing that juries will be dumb enough to to go with whatever they say just because they well it depends they, you know lift passions it it depends in this case uh, you had the element of the uh, local media had promoted this case and it made it very difficult politically for the prosecution to dismiss or withdraw their charges. In most of these cases, there's very, very little media. And if the prosecution thinks that they can quietly settle or dismiss the charges uh, without too much media illumination, then they'll do that. Uh, this was also an extremely expensive trial for a prosecution office uh, of a quite impoverished county low-income county. So many prosecutors, uh, if they have any kind of fiduciary sense about prosecuting a weak case, uh, they won't waste the kind of money that Clayton County wasted in pushing this trial. The money, presumably, for lots of lawyer time plus expert witnesses, like how else was it expensive? Yeah, they had 30 witnesses. Uh, they had a PhD, uh, you know, some Quest Diagnostics people from uh, San Juan Capistrano. Uh, many of these prosecution witnesses are paid uh, upwards of $10,000 or more, you know, four or $5,000 a day to testify. Plus, uh, you've got travel and lodging and food and, and all of that. Uh, so unlike OMSJ's experts, you know, they took the time out of their life to, to tell the truth. The prosecution's experts are all funded directly or indirectly by the healthcare and pharmaceutical industries and the diagnostic industries that are on the defense in a public trial like this. I just can't, can't help but think of the new Sean Williams civil confinement trial in New York State, which OMSJ also got involved in this past July. In both cases, the defendants were African-American men. They lost. And what is most significant for me, the outcomes did not depend on the validity of the HIV testing at all, but on other allegations. In Williams' case, whether having multiple sex partners as a young man meant that he has a certifiable mental disability while he is now in his late 30s. And in the Davis case, um, perhaps theoretically, I don't know what the jury's reasoning or if they even had any reasoning was, but whether he told his partners about his HIV status at a time when he believed in it, however erroneously, it seems like both in both cases, there was some kind of kangaroo court going on. They completely didn't want to deal with the issue of whether the diagnosis was correct. 
in that connection, was this an all African American or mostly African American jury, as I have heard? And would they have been, in your opinion, swayed by a lot of propaganda aimed toward African Americans? And I believe that uh, I should clarify that in the new Sean Williams case, I believe it was an all white jury. Yeah, uh, Nushan uh, was being tried in a small upstate New York town of Mayville, I think it's called. Mayville, and, yes. Yeah, Mayville. A, a jury, you have to remember, you know, one of the first things they did uh, when they got off, even though they are, when they went into recess and they were appointed to the uh, trial, uh, many of these jurors will you know, tell their friends, yeah, I'm on this jury and, and so on and so forth. And one way or another, uh, most, if not all, of the jurors end up identifying themselves, uh, and uh, or their neighbors will know that they were involved uh, in the case, and so it gets out. So if you're in a white town that doesn't tolerate uh, big city riffraff, particularly the African American kind of riffraff uh, that Nushan Williams represents, uh, it, there's a lot of pressure on the jury to come out with the correct verdict, lest the juror face a, a lot of uh, anger and questions and uh, hostility from the community. Uh, the same thing probably held true in this case. Clayton County is uh, more populated, I think, than uh, Mayville. But that said, they, they had the same pressures, and it would have been very difficult after, after our client was convicted of spreading HIV and admitting or saying that he was uh, HIV positive, uh, evidence didn't really matter. Yeah, it's, it's going home to their neighbors and justifying their decisions. Whether they are an all-white jury in Mayville or a, an African-American jury in a county of Georgia that has to go back and face their neighbors who have all been subject to the same AIDS propaganda. Is it the defendant's choice whether they have a jury or judge trial in a case like this? Yes, and, uh, and in this case, uh, to my best recollection, I mean, typically what we do, we advise our clients not to seek a jury trial because jurors are, for the reasons I've explained, jurors are driven by emotions. Uh, they, they do not understand complicated evidence uh, like the evidence produced in this case. So we opposed it. However, uh, um, it's not our decision to make. And the lead attorney in this case, uh, John Turner, he's been a prosecutor, a former prosecutor, career prosecutor in Clayton County, and he's now a defense attorney. He has more than 40 years of experience uh, in Clayton County, and he and his client both decided that they preferred a jury. I can't help but think that had we had a, a court trial and the judge uh, looked at it, um, uh, the judge would have acquitted. Because there's a lot of kind of logical subtleties. I mean, the, the law, from what I can gather, and, I, and make it clear I'm not a legal expert, tries to draw logical conclusions based on a whole, a whole bunch of things. But the word diagnosis to a judge uh, is probably going to mean something very different and very much more stringent than to somebody who, who said, oh yeah, I was diagnosed with the flu. And it might turn out that, you know, they met a doctor to party and he said, oh, you had this and that, then you probably had the flu. And that was a diagnosis to them, but it's not to, shouldn't be to a judge. The yeah. second, second question is that what power I was actually involved in a civil trial or an organization I'm involved with was in, involved in a civil trial uh, with a jury and uh, the jury found against us and awarded damages on things we weren't even convicted with, which I think illustrated how much the jury understood the, the whole thing. And the judge overturned the, those parts of the damage award saying that, you know, you can't award damages on something that somebody didn't do. Does the judge have any ability to mitigate the damage that the jury has done in a case like this? Yes, uh, she has a lot of discretion. Uh, but again, uh, talking about these small town judges, uh, she's not appointed, she's elected. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so uh, the, the people who vote in 
Clayton County or in most uh, uh, cities uh, across the country, uh, they like safe streets. They don't like to see riffraff running around or people they perceive as riffraff running around in the street. And if the judge uh, overturns part or all of the conviction, uh, chances are very good based on uh, such a controversial move that uh, she would never be elected as judge again. So she has to weigh her duty as a, as a judge uh, against her professional survival uh, in the next election. And she's facing an appeal um, if, almost certainly, if she overturns the jury verdict. No, no, no. no. If, if, she, if she overturned it, I, I'm not that familiar with uh, Georgia law, but in, in a lot of states, and I know in California, uh, uh, right after a jury convicted, uh, the judge uh, 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 acquitted and, and said the jury got it wrong, uh, and, uh, uh, and that can be done. I'm sure she has that kind of latitude. And had she done that, uh, once the acquittal is given, double jeopardy prevents the prosecution from refiling the case. The judge also has a lot of um, leeway on the sentence. Like, I mean, the maximum is 20 years. But if if the sentence given is is like one or two years, that would be sending a pretty strong message also, wouldn't it? That's right. And we've had uh, in one of our previous convictions, it was a military case in Virginia. Uh, the uh, after the judge convicted our, our client, uh, he sentenced our client uh, who ended up spending, I think, uh, eight or nine months in uh, in prison before being kicked out of the army. Uh, that case is currently on appeal as well. Well, um, you know, seeing what can be done going forward, I don't know uh, that there's just any out for this thing. But OMSJ is also beginning to assist with civil litigations, not just criminal cases. That is where people sue their doctors or hospitals for damages. Um, and in this case, the faulty behavior of this man's doctors and lab led to his being incarcerated. So I would think he has grounds for damages, um, if anybody does in this society. What are the chances that Davis will sue his doctors in Quest Labs over the faulty diagnosis that led to his being sent to prison? Uh, I would say that uh, there's a good chance that uh, a lawsuit would be filed, at least one, and uh, uh, this could even be larger than that because if you have laboratories and hospitals and doctors who are knowingly uh, uh, misdiagnosing people in order to um, acquire funding through Medicare and Medicaid, you're talking about fraud in the scale of hundreds of millions of dollars uh, uh, against the taxpayers uh, who pay for Medicare and Medicaid. And if Quest does this with all of their cases, and they, they run millions of tests, you're talking about uh, a, a tremendous fraud against the taxpayers of this country. Right. Um, well, but also against the, the patients. And, well, and in particular, Davis. Is there a chance that Davis himself can sue these doctors in Quest Labs, or is he barred from doing that? That's, that's a legal question. I, I really can't answer that, but it's something that uh, we are exploring right now, and uh, uh, we're, we're looking at all of our options based on the remarkable uh, testimony by the uh, Quest Diagnostics as well as the physicians involved in the case. Good, good. Um, and you are working on some litigations now, and that's great. We, we do have some previous episodes and probably one upcoming one about that, the Bobby Russell case and also our interview with Jonathan Daly. So that, that appears promising, especially since you said that this could mean as much as 90 percent of the so-called diagnoses out there are fraudulent. You know, I, and I say 90 percent because the medical literature appears to be accurate in the sense that roughly somewhere between 7 and 10 percent of the population does suffer at one time or another from an acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And so there could well be some so-called HIV positives uh, where the doctors actually observed symptoms 
and used something more than the than a lab result from a test that doesn't even read the uh, package insert. I'm uh, thinking about these women who were supposedly exposed to him. I think he only admitted to sleeping one, with one of them, and I'm not sure if one or both of them turned up HIV positive later. I mean, they've taken the same test. They've been subjected to the same faulty system. Aren't we concerned about their welfare? Um, they yeah, also they're victims believe too. they're bogus HIV tests. They are victims, and yet they're, they're being prevented from seeing themselves as victims of these doctors and hospitals, only seeing themselves as victims of this guy. You know, even my... Uh, so were they ever questioned about what they thought about that? No, no. And they didn't want to talk to us about any of these issues. But they're victims as well of the, of the same hysteria. They sat in the same courtroom hearing OMS J's witnesses testifying that these tests were bogus, and yet they didn't think, oh, this has implications for me. I mean, that to me is outrageous that they wouldn't even go there mentally. I wouldn't call the test bogus, and here's why. Well, it picks up what it picks up. Yeah, it, it, it's like it's, but it's, the significance of that is 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 unknown is, in a yeah. symptomatic yeah. patient. It's 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 right. kind of like radar uh, device. If 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 I'm enforcing speed using a radar device, um, uh, and I see you traveling at 30 miles an hour, and my radar device says you're going at 90 miles an hour, uh, then uh, it's it's not proper for me to pull you over and cite you for 90 simply because the radar device says you're going 90 miles an hour my, when my own eyes say you're only doing 30. If we apply that analogy to this case, you basically have, an, uh, have a doctor who never looked at the vehicle approaching him and asked somebody who doesn't know how to operate radar to point it and pull the trigger and to, and to get a reading and report the reading. That reading of 90 miles an hour comes back to the doctor who doesn't look at the car and says, wow, you must have been going 90 miles an hour. And so the radar device and the HIV test, they're only as good as the operator. And if the operator doesn't know what they're doing, then it's a bogus... I don't know much about radar, but I know okay. that they... I don't know if they must have stuff like this now, but if you dropped like tinfoil in the sky that you could, you could like totally mess up the radar because it would see a piece of tinfoil as, as like an airplane... Uh, because of its reflectivity. And uh, so, you know, an operator not understanding what was going on might think the sky is full of airplanes when it's actually pieces of tinfoil and, and presumably any. Yes, but an operator, an operator who knows what they're doing would see that the, uh, that the tinfoil is falling in, this, in exactly the same airspeed as the wind. And, and so, you know, while an aircraft may go 500 knots, um, if if they right. if you you know it's not going to be behaving the same way, and so the operator will be able to see the difference in the right. in this in this example with Quest Diagnostics, they didn't even want to see the difference. Well, I don't think anybody can. I'm just saying, like we have a list of of seventy or, or more possible causes for false positive HIV tests, but we actually don't know that those are causes. What happens in those cases is is uh, there will be a mysterious HIV test. There's no symptoms. Uh, there's there's no possible means of transmission. So people will say this must be a false positive, and and then they'll find out that you know a week before the guy had a flu vaccine or it was a pregnant woman or whatever, and then they'll write a paper saying we think the false positive was due to the flu vaccine or to an autoimmune condition or whatever it is, but they don't actually know that any more than, than you know that, a, 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 that there's such a thing as a true test. If a guy went to the bathos a month ago, had sex with 100 people, and then a month later tests positive, we don't actually know that that was a transmitted virus that caused that. It could have been the use of poppers, it could have been the lubricant, there could be 101 different things. We have no way of knowing what an HIV test means, I don't think. Based on the testimony of these doctors and uh, the behavior of doctors we've seen in other cases, these doctors don't even want to know. Yeah. Scary thoughts. Yeah. Well, you know, if they didn't want to know and if the jury didn't want to know and if these so-called victims didn't want to know, they were out of luck because Nancy Turner Banks showed up and made them know that in this case, at least, a, a prior use of crack cocaine, 
which apparently was true in this this defendant's case, could throw off the test. I mean, you know, just that should have brought up certain doubts, and yet no one thought twice about it. Strange. strange yeah, well, strange. you know, Courtney Shelton, uh, uh, we looked at the medical records completed by him, and uh, the, the question was never brought up. Uh, and uh, when, when you're dealing with an urban uh, county uh, uh, where there is a, a lot of use of uh, methamphetamines, crack cocaine, and other things, uh, you will see a lot of these, thousands of these cases coming into your emergency room all the time. And, uh, and after a while, you can simply look at them and sense that uh, they have been using uh, an illicit sub substance. Uh, in this case, there was no effort made by Dr. Shelton to look. It, it was just, oh, the test result, positive. Oh, that, that's must what it be. So now I'll send uh, my patient to Joyce Drayton, uh, MD uh, at Atlanta Medical Center. She then looks at uh, uh, Shelton's records and says, oh, you're a Shelton diagnosed you as HIV positive. And they're off to the races. Yeah. The, she, he points to her. She points back to him. Nobody takes responsibility again. I asked a doctor in Canada, an HIV specialist, uh, at what she knew about HIV testing, and she said, well, I send the blood away, and it comes back with a result. That's the beginning and the end of it. But that, that seems to be part of the fraud of modern medicine, is that the doctors, when asked, would say, I mean, if you asked a doctor, I mean, do you actually understand all of these things? You diagnose HIV, you diagnose depression, you diagnose this, that, and the other thing. Do you actually understand all of these things, or are they just words? And they would say, oh, no, we go to school to learn all these things, and we understand all of these things, and I'm an AIDS specialist, and I understand this. But the reality is that they, they don't. They might learn a lot about which drug to give, but when it comes to HIV testing, they're incredibly ignorant, which is just shocking to me. They've simply been through a lot of indoctrination sessions, that's all, and you haven't. So therefore, they know more than you have. Indoctrination well, in sessions, <laughs> yes. which brings me to Rodney Richards. I mean, one of, one of OMSJ's expert witnesses himself, Rodney Richards, apparently holds the patent on one of the HIV tests from the 1980s when he was a senior chemist at a company called Amgen. And, um, you know, I wondered how he feels about receiving royalties from the use of a test that, that doesn't do what it's said to do. And, and, and he's testifying against his own test, basically. But now I see that he's not necessarily testifying against his test, but against the misuse of it. Yeah, it's, it's like a car, uh, you know, or, or a uh, F-16 fighter jet. It's only as good as the operator. Going back to David's point about doctors not diagnosing uh, properly, one of the uh, leading HIV credentialing uh, boards in the U.S. is this organization called American Academy of HIV Medicine. And uh, uh, we've posted their psychologically manipulative script at uh, OMSJ's website. Um, that was the uh, scarlet letter page. Yeah, and, uh, yes. and in that report, we show how the clinician is instructed to deliver uh, their script on, on informing patients. They don't tell the patient, uh, according to AHIVM, uh, they, they don't diagnose. They simply, in the script, they say, your HIV test result is positive. And then they right. uh, you, you you may need to take to you may need take things. time yes you may need to to take time to adjust to this many people say that it gets easier once you get over the initial shock it with proper medication you notice in the script they never diagnose and on the other hand they ask these questions that imply that you should get so called support from someone who will be supportive of this point of view, not someone outside it. So it closes you into an airtight chamber of not knowing that there are other options out there. Well, you definitely shouldn't talk to denialists. That's the first thing that you'll, you'll hear. People who say that HIV might not be the cause, that HIV tests might not be accurate, that it's not sexually transmitted, stay away from those people because they're all crazy. But if you ask us tough questions, we won't answer them. You have to remember, too, that AHIVM, if you go to their website, 
of the American Academy of HIV Medicine, and you look at their corporate uh, scientific corporate uh, uh, advisory board, they're they're comprised entirely of the uh, test manufacturers and pharmaceutical companies, and if they uh, if they did anything that uh, can uh, conflicted with the promotion of these drugs and tests. Uh, AHIVM would lose all of their funding and uh, uh, they would no longer exist. Well, we're getting kind of close to the end of our hour here. And um, I'm just wondering uh, if some of our listeners want to prevent this kind of prosecution. What, what should they do and how can our listeners help in general against this problem um, by supporting OMSJ, by spreading certain news in their communities. Um, just so what can they do personally and politically against this horrible travesty of justice that's just been carried out? The best thing that a listener can do is, uh, is probably never take, uh, never get an HIV test uh, unless the doctor is able to explain exactly how the test operates and uh, how they will use the test. Knowing what I know, I would never take such a test. They can also visit our website, omsj.org, and sign up with our newsletters, and we'd be happy to uh, send them out uh, uh, regular uh, reports and and stories about what is going on in our uh, criminal and civil cases, as well as other uh, cases that we report uh, on the website. If this is new to a listener, uh, probably the best book I've read on the subject is uh, Peter Duisberg's uh, Inventing the AIDS Virus and Christine Majori's book, uh, What If Everything You Thought About uh, Thought You Knew About HIV Was Wrong. Um, so those are the best ways to get started. Well, thanks for all the information that you've given us, and all, uh, thanks for explaining a lot of the details of this this trial. And most of all, thanks for the work that you're doing, because it, it really has saved a lot of lives in, in terms of lives spent uh, productively as opposed to behind bars. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it, uh, the opportunity to, to describe the case for you. Thanks, Clark. You're an officer and a gentleman. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and thanks to our audience. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to tell all your friends about us. Goodbye. This has been another episode of How Positive Are You? Thank you for joining us. If you found our message inspiring, please be inspired in turn to give us your thoughts and feedback at info at howpositiveareyou.com, donate funds large or small, and inquire about advertising appropriate products or services on our website. Until the next time, be well, and remember, relax. It's just information. Information.